Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our first webinar. So this is the webinar for the ISBA section on uh, biostatistics in pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, um, Dr. David Ostis. Um, Dave is an applied statistician at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, USA in the Statistical Sciences Group. He primarily develops and applies Bayesian methodologies in predictive settings involving dependent data, including time series and network analysis context. His applied work focuses on helping scientists solve challenging and consequential predictive problems spanning many subject areas, including space weather, inertial confinement fusion, subsurface network modeling, and disease forecasting, which is going to be a very relevant topic for today. Uh, Dr. Ostis has spent the last few years working on influenza forecasting in the United States in the context of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Flu Forecasting Challenge called FluSight. Uh, and he's participated in this each year since the 2016-17 season. And he actually won the FluSight competition in 2018-19. And Dave received his PhD in statistics from Iowa State University in 2015. And so... I will turn it over to you Dave, um, to present. And just for everybody, um, if you do have a question, um, please type it into the chat box. Um, there's also a function, I believe, for raising your hand. And so if it's some sort of question that probably can't be answered through chat, we can take those maybe towards the end of the discussion and I can you know, allow you guys to talk and ask your questions to Dave. So without the further ado, Dave, I give it to you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk this morning. Um, yes, this ended up being a much more sort of topical timing uh, than we anticipated a few months ago when these conversations started. Um, but I'm excited to talk today. Uh, so yeah, I'm Dave Ostis, a uh, statistician at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, and I'll be talking today about multi-scale influenza forecasting in the United States. Um, I've sort of had the privilege to work in this flu forecasting world for the past few years. And so this will be some of the more recent work uh, in this area. This is joint work with uh, a what I used to say was a former, or sorry, a graduate student, Kelly Moran, but she recently successfully defended her dissertation. Uh, and I'm happy to say she will be joining me and my colleagues in the statistical sciences group at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, so before I get started, just to address the elephant in the room, uh, this is not a talk on COVID-19. Uh, however, there are definitely some similarities between influenza forecasting and just in general disease forecasting. So I will try to sort of pepper in some comments about COVID-19 and I'll sort of end with some thoughts about how this work is related to coronavirus modeling at the end. Uh, but feel free to sort of ask questions about this as you as you would like, uh, keeping in mind that um, that is not my area of expertise. Uh, so just a quick outline for the talk. Um, I'll give a quick primer on flu surveillance in the United States. Uh, then I'll talk about this flu site challenge. This is the CDC's flu forecasting challenge. Uh, and it's sort of really a lot of my work has been sort of organized around these goals. Um, I'll give sort of a quick background on some of my past work uh, leading up to my current work in this field, uh, Dante, a multi-scale flu forecasting model. Uh, and then finally, I'll finish with some results and final thoughts. So jumping right into it, uh, flu surveillance in the United States. Um, so the flu is a contagious respiratory illness uh, caused by the influenza virus. This affects millions of people every year in the United States hospitalizing hundreds of thousands of people and killing tens of thousands of people on, in a typical year. Uh, the CDC is tasked with flu surveillance in the United States. Uh, think of basically anything that you can measure. So the CDC keeps track of what flu strains are circulating, where they're circulating, at what levels they're circulating. Uh, the CDC monitors all of this via multiple efforts, uh, including their virologic surveillance. So this is lab testing. So think if you go to your doctor's office and they put that swab in the back of your throat or up your nose, that's virologic surveillance, um, as well as outpatient surveillance, which will be the focus of this talk, um, specifically the CDC's Outpatient Influenza-Like Illness Network, or ILI Net. Um, this is a collection of, I think it's about two to 3,000 different clinics, 
emergency rooms and hospitals across the United States that provide data to the CDC regarding influenza-like illness, or ILI, where ILI is defined as a temperature greater than or equal to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, a cough or sore throat, and no other known cause. So basically, ILI's definition are symptoms consistent with the flu. Um, it's important to note that ILI and flu are not the same thing. Um, you can have ILI and not have the flu. You could also have the flu and not have ILI. Um, that said, I will be using those two terms interchangeably throughout this talk. And so when I say flu, what I really mean is ILI. If I say flu in this talk and I mean a laboratory confirmed case of flu, I'll try very hard to make that clear. Uh, so just what does flu sort of look like in the United States? Uh, so what's being shown here are the last 10 flu seasons in the U.S. So on the x-axis, we have time. The flu season in the United States spans from early October until late May. And if you are familiar with flu in the United States, this uh, figure confirms everything you already know, which is that flu peaks in the winter. Right, so the zero with order description of flu is it's low in October, it rises to a peak sometime between late December and early March, and then it reverts back to low levels by the end of May. Um, however, once you sort of move past that level of description, uh, there's a lot of variability from season to season. Some seasons peak low, some peak high, some peak early, some peak late. Some have a pretty strong sort of unimodal shape, uh, while others have a very distinct bimodal shape. Uh, so, for instance, in 2019-20, uh, our current flu season has a very strong bimodal shape to it. Uh, and what you can also see is sort of that last data point. So this is the most recent ILI data from the CDC. We see this uptick uh, into that first week of March, which is not typical. Um, and the reason for that is ILI net, uh, the surveillance system, which is capturing symptoms consistent with the flu, um, is very likely capturing signals from coronavirus as well, because the symptoms of coronavirus are shared with the symptoms of flu. And so the CDC even has a disclaimer on their uh, flu surveillance page that says, going forward, we anticipate that this surveillance system will no longer just be measuring flu, but will be measuring flu and coronavirus. Um, so we sort of don't expect the rest of this year to look anything like seasonal flu because ILI net is no longer going to be just measuring seasonal flu. Okay, so that's the quick primer on flu surveillance in the United States. Uh, moving on to the flu site challenge. Uh, like I said, the CDC is tasked with monitoring the flu, but in recent years, uh, they become also interested in forecasting the flu, right? Not just being able to measure what's going on, but actually being able to anticipate what's going to happen. Uh, so in 2013, the CDC organized the first flu forecasting challenge called Flu Sites. This is a challenge open to the public. Um, and it was really just to sort of scope the feasibility of real-time flu forecasting, right? They're asking questions, what sort of logistically would it take to produce real-time forecasts? What capabilities do exist? You know, is this something that's even feasible to do? Um, and flu forecasting has really come a long way since then. I mean, today the CDC is using the flu site forecast to actually produce official communication products with the public and the state, state level public health uh, stakeholders. And they're communicating this through their uh, official CDC webpage. So this was uh, put up about a year ago. There's an actual landing site for this flu site competition. Um, this is my sort of selfish brag part of the talk. Uh, at the bottom of that webpage, they um, they list the past winners of the flu season. And so as was mentioned, I won last year. Um, and so it's sort of a nice reward to have. It's mainly for my mom and my mother-in-law to have something to brag to their friends about. But it's a, it's a reward nonetheless. Um, okay, so for the flu site challenge, what are we actually asked do. Um, so this graph over on the left, it gives you sort of a uh, sort of the typical setup. Uh, so for any given week, you have some amount of observed data. Those are those black points in the gray box. And we're asked to forecast seven different targets uh, that can be broken up into short-term and seasonal targets. So the short-term targets are we forecast one through four weeks ahead. This just gives you a uh, kind of one month ahead snapshot of what we think is coming. And then 
the three seasonal targets, um, there's the seasonal targets mean that the target doesn't change from week to week, but what changes is the data we have access to each week. So we forecast the onset. So this is the first week of the flu season, uh, as well as the peak intensity and the peak week. So the peak intensity is just what is the maximum Y value that's going to be uh, observed over the season. And the peak week is on what week will that maximum occur. Um, the forecasts need to be probabilistic. I think the CDC should be given a lot of credits for taking a very firm stance that they do not accept point prediction forecasts. Um, effectively, the CDC has said that a forecast without uh, quantified uncertainty is, is all but unusable to them. Um, so what does a probabilistic forecast look like? Uh, if you take, for instance, the peak week target as an example, we don't just say we think the peak week will be the third epidemic week of the year. Uh, there's a, sort of a CSD template that lists every week of the flu season. And what we have to do is assign a probability to each of those weeks, indicating um, the likelihood that that week will be the peak. Um, and so what I really like about that sort of conceptualization of this problem is it makes it so clear that probabilistic forecasting is sort of at its core a scarce resource allocation problem, right? If I want to assign more probability to a given week, I necessarily have to take probability away from other weeks. Um, and then the last piece of this is forecasts are needed at the national, regional, and state scales. Uh, so for the first four years of the challenge, 2013 through 2016, uh, there were only forecasts made at the national and regional scale. Um, it was sort of in 2016 that the forecasters said, you know, if we had access to state level data, we could both produce state level forecasts, but also hopefully improve national and regional forecasts. So the CDC sort of got together with all the states and they jointly agreed to publicly release their state level data. So starting in the 2017-18 season, uh, we've been making forecasts at the state scale as well. Um, so. I encourage anybody who wants to participate in this challenge that's open to the public to do so. Uh, that said, it's good to know that this isn't a light lift, right? Every week of the flu season, so just over half of the weeks of the year, uh, we produce probabilistic forecasts for seven targets at over 60 geographic locations. So it's definitely uh, can be time consuming, but I think it's also work worth doing. Um, and so anyway, that's, those are the goals of the flu site challenge. And I want to just make sure those are really clear uh, because this is sort of the organizing um, device for all of the work that I've done in this field. It's trying to think through forecasting model conceptualizations that are able to both produce short and long-term forecasts that are probabilistic that can be updated as new data comes in. So that said, I'm gonna sort of quickly walk through some of my past work in this field. Like I said, I've had the privilege to work in uh, flu forecasting for about the last five years. Um, and when you get to work in a field long enough, uh, you, you have the opportunity to sort of you know, develop a model, assess the model, identify the things you like about that model, identify the things you don't like about that model, and then iterate where you try to preserve the things you like while addressing the things you don't like. And so uh, my, my hope over the next few slides is not to describe um, these models in enough detail that you'll necessarily know everything about them, uh, rather to sort of point out the papers that they live in and also to make clear sort of what uh, sort of centrally they're trying to address. So my first um, sort of project in this flu forecasting world was actually the last chapter of my dissertation. Um, so my dissertation was on sort of state space related um, modeling challenges. Uh, my advisor, Patrizia Karagia, and I were looking for um, a sort of physics-based or differential equations model that we could embed into a state-based modeling framework. We had connections uh, at Los Alamos National Lab, and there was actually someone uh, from Los Alamos that participated in the first flu site challenge. Uh, and so they were dealing with this problem where they had an SIR model that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and they were trying to sort of add some uncertainties to that. Um, so I'll start with just quickly an SIR model. Um, this is a, order, or a system of ordinary differential equations. 
that basically it conceptualizes a population and partitions them in people in in that population into three compartments, uh, susceptible, infectious, and recovered compartments. Susceptible meaning they can get infected, infectious meaning they are infected and can spread that infection or that the disease, and then recovered means they're not susceptible nor are they infectious. Um, and so this uh, is sort of the, the model that we wanted to put into a state-based modeling framework, but one to add some stochasticity. Again, we have to come up with a forecasting model that is probabilistic. And then the other sort of main thing that we focus on is there's this structure with this SIR model that is the proportion of the population in the susceptible, infectious, and recovered groups has to sum to one across time. So we want to sort of respect that constraint while also adding some stochasticity to the process. Uh, and so in this work, we just developed, uh, we embedded basically the solution to an SIR model into the conditional mean structure of the process model. And we assigned a Dirichlet distribution, which is sort of a natural choice when you want to have um, some un uncertainties, but still respecting the fact that you have this vector of non-negative entries that has to sum to one. Um, the data model, again, we only have information on that infectious compartment um, from ILI data. And so we had the beta model as the data model relating the infectious compartment to um, the ILI data. And so, you know, it was my first attempt in this field. It got published. That was great. It helped me get uh, my degree, which is also great. Um, and, uh, but, when, when you sort of look at this model, you realize it doesn't quite do everything we would want it to do. So if you look at sort of that panel 22, what you can see is that um, by embedding the SIR model into this state space uh, framework, you have the flexibility to sort of accommodate data that doesn't quite match the SIR assumption, right? So you see sort of in the past, we're able to match um, match the model to data. But when you look at the forecast, so like in panel eight, for instance, the entire forecast is just driven by this nice smooth SIR structure. And when you look at the data, uh, ILI data more closely, you realize like there are just sort of systematic things about the data that don't line up with an SIR model. And so that led to sort of the next project, um, which was this dynamic Bayesian modeling with discrepancy. Um, so again, uh, a lot of this work was motivated by doing sort of a fairly thorough graphical exploratory data analysis. Uh, and so we're showing some of it here. So each panel is a uh, flu season. Uh, the gray line is ILI data. The black curve is sort of the best fit SIR model. So it's a fit, not a forecast here. Um, and again, you see sort of that zero with order description. The SIR model captures the general shape of the ILI data, but there's a lot of sort of like nuanced structure in this ILI data that isn't getting captured. So the little line segments you see in each of those panels is indicating ILI on the week of Christmas and then the week after Christmas. And what you see is that every year ILI drops from Christmas to the week after Christmas. And the SAR model just does not have the flexibility to capture that kind of structure. If you just plot the residuals, uh, ILI data minus that best fit SIR curve, you see something that um, is actually very exploitable. Uh, and that is this discrepancy, which that term I'm using just to mean sort of structured residuals. You see that sort of how the SIR model fails to capture the ILI data it has a lot of commonalities across flu seasons. Um, and that, again, is a very exploitable structure. Uh, and so for this work, the whole point was trying to capture that sort of systematic difference between an SIR model and the data. Uh, and so again, we have another state space model. The data model is basically the same as the previous, uh, but what's different here is this process model. It isn't any longer just an SIR model. It's an SIR model plus a discrepancy piece. That's that mu T and that delta J T where T is indexing week and J is indexing flu season. I basically the mu T plus the delta J T is modeling this process here. That sum is shown over on the left side in the third row uh, is sort of capturing that systematic structure. And sort of the main thing about this uh, effort uh, is uh, the sort of the main accomplishment is demonstrated in the 
top row, that first panel there. Um, so that's the actual forecast for the 2015 flu season after we've seen five observations. And you can see that the forecast no longer just has that smooth SIR structure. It's actually capturing that anticipated drop from Christmas into the following weeks. And that is entirely driven by this sort of new T term, this discrepancy term that's common to all seasons. And so that was sort of the win of this model relative to the previous one, which is that the forecast is now actually able to deviate from that SIR model structure. Um, this model, DBM, dynamic Bayesian model, uh, competed in the 2017-18 flu site challenge and got fourth place. Uh, the next thing was a very simple sort of extension to the DBM model. Um, and it produced a model that we call DBM plus. Uh, and so sort of to understand this model, um, there's really sort of two things that are noteworthy. Uh, the first is that, um, so about 10 years ago, uh, some people at Google wrote a paper that got published hey, in nature where, yes. Can I stop you for a second? There's a question. Yeah. Um, yep. the, so the question was for that model, is mu t conditional to the value at a later week? Um, yes, so sorry, that's a good point. So it's, yes, uh, both mu t and delta t have a reverse random walk assigned to it. So it is conditioning on uh, the future week to go back. And the reason uh, we do this uh, sorry, is sort of shown back here with the data. So flu has this sort of interesting property to it where usually when you do forecasting, right, sort of the larger the forecast window, the more uncertainty you have in your forecast. That is not true and should not be true of flu. And the way to think about that is if you're standing on the first week of October and you're asked to make a three months ahead forecast, you're asked to forecast what's going to happen in early January, there's a lot of uncertainty there, right? It could be really high or it could still be really low. If you are, however, in October asked to make an eight month ahead forecast, sort of what is flu going to look like at the end of May, you could make that pretty confidently. That is, that reverse random walk is basically exploiting um, a property of the flu data that says, I don't know how we're going to get from low levels in October to low levels in May, but we're betting very strongly that we will return to low levels in May. And so that's sort of the, the main motivation for the reverse random walk piece of that model. Were there any other, sorry, yeah. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing the chat box, so. No, that, that was do. it, and they say okay, thank great. you. So I think you answered yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so this model, DVM Plus, uh, sort of the two main things, again, were um, about 10 years ago, some people like Google wrote a paper that showed that you can map um, search activity for certain terms, uh, which are reflections of people's health status, so people searching for cold, cough, fever, sneezing, stuff like that. And you can build basically a fancy regression model that maps those search terms to official ILI data. So that's one piece of it. And then the other piece of it is that um, flu data released by the CDC comes out at a one to two week delay. Um, the reason for that is that data is based on sort of patient visits with their doctors. That data has to uh, is based on these patient visits. It has to get accumulated. It has to get sent up, sort of sent up this bureaucratic chain. It has to get organized before it's ultimately disseminated to the public. Um, and so what that does is it creates this sort of one-week opportunity where you could try to fill in the gap created by this reporting delay. And so what people have done is they said, well, I don't know the CDC's official flu data for a week, but I do have access to what people searched for on Google. And so if I have this mapping that takes inputs from Google and maps it to outputs from the CDC, I have that one week opportunity where I actually have the inputs from Google and I can guess what the output from the CDC is going to be. So DBM Plus, all it does is it shows if you build a model like that and you append that um, prediction that fills in the gap and you just append it to the end of CDC data, 
and just run DBM now with this augmented set of data, you can actually sort of improve your forecasting. Uh, so DBM Plus, um, again, participated in the 2017-18 challenge, got third place. It participated last year, and it got second place. Uh, it's participating this year, and we won't know what those results are for a few months. Uh, so that leads me into sort of my current work um, in this field, um, related, which is called Dante. Um, so this work is up on archive right now, and is under review. Um, and so all of the work up to this point didn't share any information across geographical units. So all those models were just run for a single geographical unit. Um, so the, the sort of the main goals of Dante are to build just one unified model um, that does your state level forecasting, sharing information, but also aggregates up to produce um, regional and national forecasts as well. So this is the main thing is we're pushing now down to the state scale and we're trying to have one model that does all of this stuff for us. Um, as with DBM, um, so much of that work was really motivated by doing uh, a graphical exploratory data analysis, identifying structure in the data, and then building a model to capture that structure. Um, we're gonna do the same thing with Dante. And so the next few slides are just gonna be talking about some of the interesting sort of features we see in these ILI data um, before we start talking about how we're gonna build a model to address this structure. Uh, so the first piece is that there is spatial variability, uh, that map over on the right, these orange states are states that have average ILI above the national average. Purple states are states that have ILI, average ILI below the national average. You can see sort of our higher ILI activity states seem to be concentrated around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, over on the left, you're just seeing sort of a breakout of a few of those states. Um, so the black line is the national average ILI. You see, if you just take that average, you're getting that drop around Christmas time, as we talked about before. Um, that black line is the exact same in every panel, and it's just in there for a reference. So we see for the District of Columbia and Alabama, for instance, uh, almost every week of every flu season uh, sees ILI levels above their corresponding national average. Iowa and Montana is the exact opposite. Almost every week we see below the national average. So there's very clear evidence uh, in the data that states should be treated distinctly because they have very different personalities. Um, we also see that there's seasonal variability. Um, so for instance, a lot of times when we talk about a flu season, we'll say it's a bad flu season or it's a mild flu season. That comment is usually in reference to what's going on nationally, but we see that when you break that down to the state level, um, you can see a lot of commonalities within a season. So for instance, in 2015, all of the purple states there are states that in 2015 had ILI below their state specific average. So it was not just a mild season nationally, almost every state saw lower levels of ILI than they usually see. 2017 is the exact opposite. Almost every state saw ILI levels above their national average. So in the previous slide, right, there was evidence that these states need to be treated distinctly from one another. Uh, while this slide is saying, but there's also something within a season that's gonna need to tie all of these states together because within a season they can act very similarly. Um, let's see, volatility and ILI net participation. So when you um, just start looking at some of these time series at the state level, you'll see a lot of things that look like Montana, right? Again, sort of that zeroth order, it starts low, it ramps up to a peak and it drops back down to low levels. You sort of have that signature, but for that Montana 2017-18 data set, it's just really noisy, it's jagged, and it's jumping all over the place, and it just, it's hard to see the signal. Um, Virginia, however, uh, you see that sort of signal, and it's just very clear, right? You have a nice smooth curve there. Uh, and the point is that that sort of the jaggedness of Montana versus the smoothness of Virginia, that's not random. Um, it's happening, and it's sort of easy to see why it's happening when you remember sort of what ILI is. It is fundamentally, it's an estimate of a proportion, where the denominator of that proportion is the total number of patient visits for a state week. 
So for Montana, they typically, in a given week, they typically see 3,300 patients. Uh, in Virginia, they see almost 90,000 patients a week. So you have a much bigger denominator for Virginia than you do in Montana, allowing you to get a much more stable estimate of that proportion. Um, the scatter plot over on the right is just showing that average denominator size on the x-axis. And then the y-axis is just, uh, it's a measure of volatility. It's basically trying to capture sort of how jagged or smooth is that time series. And what you see is that that volatility drops as the denominator gets bigger. Said another way, which is probably uh, more insightful, is that as we, again, as a field, want to push our forecasting down to more and more granular scales, right? We're at the state scale now. We'd like to go sub-state at some point, whether that's county or municipality. Uh, but this sort of plot makes it really clear that unless we change how we do surveillance, pushing down to finer geographic scales means we're necessarily going to inherit smaller denominators, meaning we're necessarily going to see things that look more like Montana and fewer and fewer things that look like Virginia. And that is has nothing to do with flu and has nothing to do with disease transmission and has everything to do with how you estimate a proportion. Uh, and then the, so the final EDA piece I'm going to call out, again, is this sort of nested geographic scales, right? So we're going to make forecasts nationally, regionally, and at the state level. But those scales are not independent from one another, right? The nation is nothing more than a collection of regions. A region is nothing more than a collection of states. And what you see in these, these data that are released by the CDC is that regional and national ILI is, is nothing more than a U.S census-weighted linear combination of state-level ILI. So if you know what's going on at the state level, you don't have any additional unique information available to you from the regional or the national scales. So recapping some of these challenges before we get into the actual modeling of Dante. Um, so again, we have this spatial variability and seasonal variability. We have this heterogeneous volatility that we're going to want to address, and we have these non-independent scales. Um, so the goal of this work is to develop a probabilistic flu forecasting model that can meet all of the flu site forecasting objectives while simultaneously addressing all of these aforementioned data challenges. And so Dante is a multi-scale probabilistic flu forecasting model that attempts to do this. Um, the diagram at the bottom here uh, is, I think, just a sort of useful sort of conceptual organizational device to understand how Dante is decomposed. Uh, you can think of Dante as broken up into two sub-models. There's a state-level model and an aggregation model. So we're going to do a modeling at the state scale, and then we're going to sort of take those state forecasts and aggregate up regionally and nationally. And then the state level model is partitioned into a data model and a process model. This is very similar to sort of the previous strains of work I've done uh, by treating this as kind of a state space model. Um, I always forget, uh, someone always asks me, I always forget to say where the name Dante came from. Um, so, so when I think about uh, forecasting right, nationally, that drills down regionally, that then drills down to states, the sort of like going deeper uh, down this nested hierarchy just makes me think of the circles of hell from Dante's Inferno. Um, so I was going to call this model circles of hell and thought that was way too grim. And then I thought about calling it Inferno, which I still thought was maybe a little too closely associated with hell. And so I ended up settling on Dante. Um, but that's where the name comes from. It's really thinking of this sort of nested uh, hierarchical organization geographically. Okay, um, so the next few slides, I'm just going to work through these terminal nodes of that um, sort of organization, Dante's organizational device. Um, so the first slide, actually, let me back up one second. Um, Again, my goal for the next few slides is not to describe Dante in enough detail that you will necessarily understand all of it. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the preprint, or yeah, the preprint. Um, but my what my goal is is to sort of connect the modeling decisions of Dante with the EDA slides I just showed you uh, to really motivate how those slides really dictated the way that um, we chose to do our modeling. Okay. So for 
Dante's, the state level data model, kind of the main thing that this is trying to capture is that heterogeneous volatility, right? The really jagged Montanas versus the much smoother Virginias. The way that Dante does that is with this state specific parameter, lambda r, r is indexing state. Um, and that parameter basically governs the variance of the data model. You see it shows up in the denominator of that variance term. And so when lambda r is big, the variance is small, and that's what we would expect to see when we have a much smoother or stronger signal like the Virginia's. Uh, when lambda is small, the variance is big, and that's sort of reflecting a much noisier time series. Uh, the scatter plot over on the right, I thought I uh, ended up sort of working out maybe better than I thought it would have. Uh, so the x-axis, again, is that average denominator um, that I showed you earlier. And then the y-axis is the posterior mean of lambda r. So lambda r has a hierarchical model uh, over it. So Dante is learning the value of lambda r. It is not being specified in any way. And you see that there's clearly a relationship between the posterior mean of lambda r and that average denominator size. What to me was really cool about this is that that x-axis there, the average denominator side, is not an input to Dante. It doesn't show up explicitly anywhere. All Dante sees is sort of the volatility of that ILI time series. It has a parameter, a state-specific parameter to account for it, and it's clearly learning something that is related to how these proportions are being estimated. Um, the state level process model. Um, so at least the way I think of forecasting is, um, to me, forecasting is sort of fundamentally about how you choose to balance model structure with model flexibility. Model structure being the thing in your model that allows you to forecast more than just a couple steps ahead model flexibility being the thing that allows you to sort of quickly adjust your model when you see data that you weren't expecting to see. So in DBM, for instance, the structure came from the SIR model and the flexibility came from that discrepancy model. Uh, we have sort of the same idea here in Dante. However, we're not using an SIR model at all anymore. So the way Dante's process model works is it basically is the sum of these different random or reverse random walks. So the random walk is just this flexible or right, time series model that's capturing temporal correlation. Uh, and it's gonna be allowed to sort of move and adjust the data really quickly. So that's where the flexibility of Dante uh, comes in. The way we get structure out of that is by deploying these random walks in very constrained environments. Um, and so the probably is easily described uh, just by looking at this figure here. So there are four rows. Uh, I'm showing um, Dante results for two states, Alabama and Iowa, and two seasons, 2015 and 2017. Uh, the first four columns correspond to the four different random walk model components of Dante's process model. So the first component is this new all term. And this is just a, this is basically the anchor of Dante's forecasting model. It's a random walk. Um, so it can be whatever the data needs it to be. Uh, however, the key is that every state and every season has to share the same random walk. So whenever you're asking a diverse collection of things to all compromise, uh, mathematically, you're going to get something that looks like an average, and that's exactly what you see from you all. It is basically the average of ILI on the logit scale. Um, a few slides ago, however, I showed you a plot that said, hey, states are pretty distinct from each other, all right? Alabama has really high ILI. Iowa has really low ILI. So that's where the mu state term comes in. Again, it's a random walk that is specific, or sorry, is uh, Every state gets its own random walk, but the key is that every season within that state has to share that random walk. So that's why you see, for instance, for Alabama, that uh, if you look at the second column there, the first and third row, uh, that random walk is whatever Alabama needed it to be, but you see that it's the exact same um, random walk in that first and third row, saying that both 2015 and 2017 of Alabama has to share the same thing, similarly for Iowa. 
Uh, you have the exact same thing again for new season, uh, it just sort of flipped, right? Every season is going to get its own specific random walk, but all of the states within that season have to share the same random walk. So this is the piece that ties these states together within a season. And then finally, this new interaction term, this is the most flexible component of Dante. Again, it's a random walk, but it's specified for each season state pair. So there's no sort of um, compromising that's being done across states or seasons here. Uh, so this is the piece that can really get out of control fast because there's little data to constrain it. Um, so what we do is we just sort of highly regularize this term towards zero. Basically, what we're saying to Dante is you are allowed to use this term new interaction if needed, but we would strongly encourage you to try to explain the variability in the data with all other modeling components. Um, and so once you have those sort of four terms, uh, this pi is just you add up those first four columns to get pi. You then take the inverse logit of it to map it back onto the zero one uh, ILI scale. And that's how uh, the process model works in Dante. Uh, the final piece of Dante, again, is this aggregation model. So sort of at its, at its core, Dante is just this Bayesian, the conditionally specified Bayesian model. Um, so we get draws from the posterior predictive distribution via MCMC. But once you have those draws, the aggregation model is really straightforward. You just take these linear combinations um, you take these linear combinations of these draws uh, to, to produce your regional and national forecast. Um, so what's going on here is right, some sort of central limit type behavior. So what, what you see is sort of through that aggregation process, you get sharper and sharper forecasts. Um, what's being plotted here are the four short-term targets. And you see that the 90% highest posterior density interval width uh, goes down as you course in scales. Again, this is sort of corresponding to you're going from things that look like that Montana time series with a really small denominator, and you're aggregating up to things that should be much smoother because they have much bigger denominators. Um, okay, so we can just, I'm going to show this quick video. This is sort of what the 2018-19 forecast looked like. Um, so what you're seeing here, uh, the, the green points are the ILI that was available at the time of the forecast. Uh, the green line is the posterior predictive mean. This is if we were to give a point prediction, that's what we would give. Um, also showing the 80 and 95% percent, uh, percentile prediction intervals. Uh, the black points are the validation ILI, and you'll see this vertical black line move from left to right. All of the, the uncertainty to the right of that line is our forecast uncertainty. There's a whole nother component to this work. Uh, basically, the data we have access to any given week will get revised every week. So there's some sort of data revision uncertainty as well. That's what the uncertainty to the left of this line indicates. And you can just sort of ignore that for the moment. But uh, here. Sorry, not, Sorry. not to interrupt. Uh, before you start the movie, can I ask uh, yeah. there's a question? Yep. Um, they wanted to know what is the motivation behind modeling the mu interaction term as a reverse random walk. So it's the same. Uh, it's the same motivation again uh, from the DBM model, which is we're we're banking really hard on saying we don't know sort of how we're going to go from the start of the season to the low levels at the end of the season, but we think that we're going to get to low levels at the end. The real sort of um, consideration for this was was that if you just let this random walk run forward in time in an unconstrained way, that new interaction term can sort of blow up. And what you end up getting in your forecast are these just sort of indefensibly wide prediction intervals um, by sort of conditioning at the last time and sort of forcing it to go back. You're effectively trying to turn an extrapolation problem and make it an interpolation problem. So that's the, the motivation for the reverse random walk for that term. Does that seem good? Or yeah. was there uh, another question related to that? No, that, that was it. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so we'll just sort of, these are what the forecast looked like. So to be clear, what you're seeing right now, this is the forecast made by Dante given one week of data for the entire 2018-19 flu season. 
Um, so we see it sort of, again, it marches across. We're able to update uh, the forecast. Forecasts look pretty good uh, right now. And they start to look not so great from about mid-January through mid-February. Um, and then they sort of get back in line over here. And so the, the one thing, um, let's see if I can start this over. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is sort of right here, right? So the forecast is anticipating that there will be a second wave, but it is not anticipating that it's going to be as exaggerated as it is. So it's fair to say that our forecasts are just sort of wrong at this point in the season. And what you see is that over the next four weeks, it's basically the data is just dragging the forecast up this hill here. Um, and this is actually where the flexibility of Dante really serves it well, right? At this point, we're about to see data that we were not anticipating seeing. It would obviously be better if we could have simply anticipated this, but we didn't. If our model was too structured, it would have a very hard time quickly adapting to this sort of new data regime we find ourselves in. And it's really the flexibility of Dante that allowed us to quickly sort of adjust our forecast to match the data. Uh, okay, so that was sort of the Dante description. Um, the results, uh, I guess I already sort of mentioned, uh, it went about as well in 2018-19 for the LANO models as it could have gone uh, in a relative sense. Um, Dante, again, got first, DVM plus, uh, got second place last year. And then I'm just gonna call it the FluSight network. This is a, a, an ensemble model led by Nick Reich at UMass Amherst. Um, and so they're about, half a dozen teams that provide about 20 different component models um, that the FluSet network is basically a weighted ensemble of these different component models. Um, I call it out because one DBM plus is the highest weighted component in uh, the FluSite network, but also that the FluSite network is the model that the CDC uses for communication purposes with the public. Um, the CDC over these last few years has really, I think, bought into this idea of ensembles, not necessarily as a way of sort of raising the ceiling of forecasting, but as a way of sort of significantly raising the floor. Um, all the ensemble models that have participated in the Blue Side Challenge, they don't always sort of do the best, but they're almost never in, say, the bottom half of the models. So for a very risk-averse agency like the CDC, an ensemble has a lot of appeal to it. Um, uh, I just, I'm just gonna make a quick point here, and I think this, this audience is probably uh, not one that needs to have this driven home, because I'm sure you already know this, but to some other audiences that I talked to about this work, uh, this is a pretty important point. Um, so people sometimes wonder, you know, what does a good probabilistic forecast mean? What does that look like? And I think a lot of people think that small uncertainties mean good uncertainties, and that is just not true. Uh, in fact, it's the models that have the sharpest forecasts or the smallest or tightest intervals are the models that do the worst uh, in the flu site challenge. Uh, that's because we use for the flu site challenge, uh, well, in the past, we used a sort of modification of a log score, uh, which was sort of motivated by seemingly reasonable um, uh, reasons, but ended up producing a, a scoring rule that was improper. Uh, we have changed that and going forward, we're just using a proper log scoring rule. But basically the, the, this modified log scoring rule, um, effectively it, it severely penalizes you for being confident and wrong, basically for having a sharp forecast that you have sort of no business making. Um, and what I'm just showing here is that uh, you have your 80% highest posterior density interval width. Uh, this is for the two week ahead target. Uh, each dot is a different model. And then the Y axis is the forecast scale scored by the CDC. Uh, what I do is I find the model that has the highest forecast skill to partition all the other models into two groups. The red group are all of the models that make sharper forecasts on average than the best scoring model. And the blue group are the models that have um, less sharp forecasts than the best scoring model. And what you see across every target is that the sharper 
forecast um, group always scores lower, um, suggesting that sort of on balance, the flu forecasting community has a little bit of an overconfidence problem. Uh, so just finishing up here, um, so as I hope was sort of made clear by showing this progression of work that I've, uh, I've been sort of engaged in over the past half decade, um, Dante is no different in the sense that Dante is not a finished product. Dante is just sort of a goalpost along this path of continued model development. Um, I do think, though, Dante represents a very sort of important model for this flu forecasting field. Um, in many ways, Dante was developed very intentionally to ask or to address the question, how far can we push flu forecasting without using really any of the things that I think people traditionally have thought are needed to do good flu forecasting, right? We don't incorporate any flu strain data. We don't have any vaccination data. We don't have provider type data. We don't make use of any weather data or any network sort of connectivity data. There's not even a disease transmission model in Dante anymore. So all of these things that I think have traditionally been thought are required to do good forecasting uh, have been stripped away from Dante. And I think Dante is important because it doesn't just assert that you can do good forecasting without using that stuff. It actually demonstrated it in real time. Um, now that all said, I think Dante can be improved by including this stuff, by incorporating flu strain data, by bringing you know, a disease transmission model back into it, I think has a lot of appeal but uh, Dante sort of very intentionally was developed to try to not use those things. Um, and this, I think, leads us to sort of tying this back, and I'll just sort of finish up here, uh, sort of the connection between some of these flu forecasting models and how we address the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, so the flu forecasting community, I think it's fair to say, finds ourselves in a very uncomfortable position in that all models um, that participate in FluSight, you could partition into the models that have some kind of flexible modeling component, whether that you wanna call that a statistical model or a machine learning model or an AI model uh, or something like that, right? DBM's discrepancy model, Dante's entire model is a flexible model. Um, you, can, you can have the models that have a flexible modeling component and those that don't a model that's maybe just like uh, an SIR type model with some sort of random white noise added to it. We know from over half a decade of flu forecasting that on balance, the models that have a flexible modeling component do better than the models that don't have that component in it. However, th what enables us to have this flexible model component is the data assets that flu provides us that we absolutely don't have for coronavirus, right? Dante only works because we have 10 historical seasons that we can learn patterns from and exploit those patterns. We don't have any historical seasons of coronavirus. So Dante is really neutered in this setting. Like I would not just take these random walks and just swap in coronavirus data and run it and think that anything reasonable is gonna come out of it. Because the way it, again, got structure was by learning stuff from the past and assuming it's going to apply in the future. We don't have any past to learn from with coronavirus. And so I think right now and over the coming years, I think the, the flu forecasting community is going to have to really think through how do we take these models that have exploited the data assets that we have in flu, but sort of re-modify them so that they can be more usable in these new sort of novel pandemic settings. Um, and I think with that, I'll just leave this up, but I think I will finish up and just again say thank you for the invitation to talk this morning. Um, it's a very, very interesting time to be a disease uh, forecaster and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dave. That that was a that was a great talk. Um, Thanks. Very very topical. Um, I'm seeing trying to see if uh, any questions are going to start popping up or not. Um, 
you could probably even if you want, you could probably exit the full screen so you could see the questions. If, if sure, it's... sure. Uh, I'm just gonna not share my screen at the moment. Uh, okay. So there's a question from Anna about how long does it actually take for the model to run? Uh, so Dante, um, so uh, Dante takes about six to seven hours to run. Uh, there are a lot of redundant sort of computations in it right now that I think would alleviate some of that time. Um, but so six or seven hours sounds like a long time and in some sense it is, but sort of on the scope of the flu forecasting challenge, right? New data gets released at about noon on Friday and then forecasts are due at midnight uh, the following Monday. So you basically have the weekend. And so I kind of got into this just routine of every Friday I download the data, I hit run before I would go to bed and then I would wake up and drink way too much coffee um, and look over some plots that are produced from the model output. So it sort of, it works on that time scale, but yeah, six to seven hours. Uh, and I think they're finding ways to sort of reduce that time is gonna be needed as we try to expand flu forecasting. Okay, another question is, Flu forecasting in the US, what about borrowing trends from other countries or borrowing from Northern US to Southern US? Um, so I think some of the, there's sort of a couple different issues there. So one of the challenges with other countries, actually, I'm gonna share my screen again to point something out. Um, okay. Um, so if we look at this thing, so again, that, the green line here is basically just sort of the average ILI across all seasons in the states. And what you find is that there are some, um, some structure in these data that are uh, sort of country specific. So one of the challenges of borrowing trends from other countries would be capturing some of these sort of data challenges. So like right here uh, in late November, we see a little bump up and that always coincides on the week of Thanksgiving, right? So some of the structure we're seeing in our data is just that seasonal effect. We see a much stronger, sort of more dominant effect over Christmas that other countries might share. Um, and so I think there are just some sort of challenges looking at other countries in that ILI data is not just capturing a disease transmission process, it's also capturing this data collection process, which is gonna be very geographically sort of specific. Um, the comment though about sort of Southern versus uh, Northern US, I think there's a lot of opportunities to do something there. Um, so we did sort of a further analysis about sort of empirical versus nominal coverage uh, for Dante. And what, what we have found is that the coverages um, at the state level are pretty good. The empiricals match the nominals pretty well. But as you aggregate up to this scale, uh, we find that our coverages are too low um, regionally and nationally, indicating that um, basically sort of the total variability we're capturing at the state level seems appropriate, but too much of it is coming from um, components that get washed out in the aggregation process. Uh, and I think the sort of most obvious way to sort of extend this would be rather than have this new season term uh, common to all states, have some sort of like partitioning of the states. So you would sort of have multiple new season terms. Uh, and that I think would help alleviate some of this uncertainty washing away in the aggregation process. Another question would be, do you think including vaccination data would affect your forecasting results? I think it could. The real challenge with the vaccination data uh, is that you don't get your sort of first reliable estimate of how effective the vaccine is until about February. So you're not going to have that information available to you for the first half of the season while you're forecasting. Okay. And Another question was, would it be possible to use the current ILI surveillance data and subtract the predicted flu cases using your Dante model to get an estimate for the surplus cases, which are likely to be coronavirus? Sounds like somebody just 
dug right into my brain and thought about how to do that. Yeah, that's that's sort of exactly what I would think to do is just to say now ILI is some function of seasonal flu plus coronavirus, and we have a model for just the seasonal flu. So yeah, if you just take measured ILI, subtract out uh, the Dante model, you can at least, I would say, defensively make the assumption that what is left could be attributed to coronavirus. Okay. Um, I think that is all the questions that were raised. Um, I have a less statistical question. I just more of a curiosity. Once you won this competition, um, has the CDC now been messaging you or <laughs> coming, coming I, I, to you for it, advice or anything like that? I do. So, so the CDC has, so, um, right. The primary goal of them in 2013 setting up this challenge was to address forecasting with flu. A secondary goal was to sort of assemble a collection of flu forecasters that could be called upon, for instance, when the world we live in right now sort of unrolls and a pandemic breaks out. So that we've been in close communication with the CDC sort of this whole time um, in this coronavirus world. Uh, the other sort of just winning and having your name up on that web page is less maybe about how the CDC reaches out to you and more how uh, different sort of media reporters reach out to you and ask you to speculate wildly about what's going to happen. So that's interesting. All right. Well, I guess if there's no other questions, we'll probably just end it here. And thank you again for giving us this great presentation. And uh, yeah, it was it was really interesting. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Everyone be safe. All righty. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Yep. Bye. Bye.